September 17, 2019, I'd like to call the Fitchburg City Council to order. Please be advised that FATV is conducting audio and video recording of this meeting for public broadcast. I would ask that anyone else in the audience who is recording this meeting please identify themselves uh, for the record now by standing and stating your name and address. Is anyone uh, wishing to record at this time? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Fleming, would you please lead us in the salute to the flag? To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please conduct the roll call? President Kishore. Present. Councillor Boschman. Present. Councillor Clark. Councillor Dean Natale. Here. Councillor Donnelly. Here. Councillor Fleming. Here. Councillor Green. Here. Councillor Caddy. Present. Councillor Squalia? Present. Councillor Walsh? Present. Councillor Zarella? Here. Uh, before we uh, we go to a public forum, uh, I think twice uh, uh, now in a couple of months, we're going to go off script uh, here for, uh, for an item that was not uh, listed on the agenda. Uh, at this time, I'd like to um, uh, to invite State Senator uh, Dean Tran and State Representative Stephen Hay uh, to join us uh, at the front. Uh, we have um, we have three city councilors uh, who are uh, leaving this council, retiring from the city council uh, in their service to the city uh, after collectively uh, more than 40 years uh, of elected service to the city. Uh, it's an incredible feat. Um, and this is an opportunity, I think, that we as a city um, uh, need to come together and, and recognize these individuals. That said, I'd like to turn the floor over uh, to State Representative Stephen Hay. And I was going to cry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, tonight I'm here because I have citations for Councilor Donnelly, Councilor Clark, and Councilor Caddy, um, thanking them for the years of service to the, the, the City of Fitchburg. Um, I'd just like to say that I was on the City Council when all three of them came on. Um, the dedication and the hard work that they have put in on behalf of the residents of the City of Fitchburg uh, should be commended. Well, um, we oftentimes agreed on subjects, sometimes we disagreed on subjects, and that was fine, because when all was said and done, bottom line, end of the day, however you want to say it, um, all of us, which is Fitchburg guys, Fitchburg guys trying to do well by our city, and um, the time and effort that they've all put, put in should be commended, and I can only hope that the folks who um, replace them um, have the work ethic, the integrity, and the dedication that the three of them have. So I would personally like to thank all three of them. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, good evening, uh, Council President and um, members of the uh, City Council, as well as Mayor Di Natale. Um, likewise, I'm here on behalf of the State Senate. I also have uh, citations that I would like to present to all three City Councilors. Um, you know, I, I echo the sentiments mentioned by my colleague here, Representative Hay. Um, I had the pleasure of serving on the City Council with all three of you. Um, to see all three of you retiring right now makes me uh, extremely feel like I'm old. Um, you know, You're getting uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, all joking aside, um, I truly appreciate the time that I spent on with all three of you. I truly appreciate the uh, the service that you have rendered uh, to the city of Fitchburg, and um, with that being said, you know I congratulate you on the behalf of the state senate. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. Can you do a picture? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Councilor Caddy. <coughs> Councilor Donnelly. How about Councilor Walshman in here? <laughs> Steve, you got a handkerchief. I feel like crying. <laughs> I got to use the Kleenex. Can you? you huh? I got to use the Kleenex. Oh. <laughs> Enjoy 
But uh, also, last but not least, uh, my my colleague and I would like to uh, wish all of you a, uh, a very uh, Merry Christmas and a, a, a happy, happy holidays, holidays. <laughs> and, a, and a very uh, healthy New Year. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Get Beacon Hill so, our regards. Uh, we're not quite done yet. Uh, we have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, a citation uh, from from the city, uh, from the the mayor and and myself. But uh, I'll just add, uh, all three uh, of you individuals, uh, you know, uh, were were instrumental, you know, to my my early years as a council, uh, and as uh, as I developed uh, as a counselor uh, and took on the role of president. Um, all three of you were at times shy. Wouldn't quite be the word. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, you were you were always willing to speak your mind and give advice um, and essential <coughs> needed advice and you know I've disagreed with each of you on different issues uh, but at the end of the day I knew that your heart um, and your efforts were truly focused on how to make this city a better place um, you care about it so um, so immensely and I think we're a better city because of the work that you've uh, the work and the years that you've you've given to the city um, I know it's, uh, you know, I, the, the coming to the meeting uh, may be the easy part of what we do, but there's an incredible sacrifice behind the hours um, that go into it, and uh, and I think sacrifice is the right word. You you both have given up a lot to to serve the city and Councilor Clark as well. So, uh, truly a heartfelt uh, thank you uh, from from the city uh, for everything that you've done. And uh, I hope that uh, hope you continue to watch us on Tuesday nights. Uh, but I suspect uh, <laughs> I suspect you're going to relish having your uh, your Tuesdays back, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, I too had the honor of serving with each each one of the individuals who who are retiring uh, this evening. And uh, I, I I as not just a, as a certainly as a citizen of Fitchburg and as the mayor. I'm going to miss uh, the fact that they had a strong and abiding sense, a common sense, and uh, and it was a pleasure to deal with uh, what sometimes can be trying, because you're not dealing well, oftentimes with adults. Uh, you got people who behave as less than that. But these gentlemen, in this particular case, they were all three gentlemen. Uh, I will so sorely miss as the mayor of the city of Fitchburg. Uh, not only were they are they friends, but uh, confidence and uh, and uh, counsels uh, that I could turn to, and uh, and get a uh, you know a straight answer from, and that's that's sometimes uh, at a premium in this job. So we have a citation. I have a citation for them, and you know, folks at home and here, you're looking at over, Mr. President, over 45 years, 40 over years, 40 years, 40 of, years uh, of service public service that uh, oftentimes goes without without uh, much thanks but uh, we are certainly a grateful city and these guys are really really uh, the city is all that mattered to them that was what was important to them and again something sometimes that's uh, elusive and we were lucky to have uh, people that were so committed so again let me just read that uh, repre uh, representative <laughs> Councilor Dave Clark 06 to 2019 E Thomas Donnelly from o from 2000 to 07 there's a slight break and then 2016 to 2019 and Councilor Caddy from 04 to 2019 how impressive is that thank you uh, gentlemen from a grateful city I'm going to miss you, Joe. <laughs> See you, Tom. Good luck to you. Yeah, you got to yes. do one with the mayor. Steal <laughs> Stop with us. That way you can be on the, those those lonely Tuesday nights. You can be remembered. <laughs> yeah. Again, he's on a meal. <laughs> oh, oh. oh. <laughs> you two are front and center. You're not hiding on this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
sure keep them in front of me. Get right behind you, Joe. So Paul, get behind Joe so we can see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I had an interesting comment today. Someone told me they had been jeweled. I know, I don't know what you're saying. You've become a verb. I should be back in now. Joel, you've become a verb. Is that to be volunteered? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I, oh, yeah, you heard that before? <laughs> Context. Yeah. Did you hear that? I was. <laughs> and it was, it was said in a very nice way. Are you guys hanging on? So again, thank you uh, to counselors Clark, uh, Donnelly, and Caddy, and also thank you in this case to their to their wives, uh, who have let us as a city collectively uh, steal them away from uh, graduations and ceremonies and uh, and dinners uh, for over 40 years. So thank you. Uh, now we'll we'll jump back into the agenda. Public forum. Uh, anyone wishing to speak on any matter on the agenda may do so for not more than two minutes. If you are here addressing public hearing petitions, you'll have an opportunity to speak at that time. Please approach the center table and identify yourself by name and address for the record and the item number on the agenda which you're addressing. Good, Good evening, evening Chief. Mr. President, Chief Motno, Fitchburg Police Department. I'd like to speak to order number 20, uh, 292.19 this evening. And Mr. President, I would request the opportunity to go into suspension of the rules to discuss this order. Motion for suspension of the rules. Second. second. Motion and second for suspension of the rules on 292.19. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? It is unanimous the matter is before the council. Chief. Thank you. Um, if you. If you recall, last year at this time, I, I came to this body at the same amount of time and asked for suspension last year. This is a reoccurring grant from the Executive Office of Public Safety. This is a high visibility traffic grant, traffic grant that the police department has been awarded once again this year in the amount of $12,000. Um, the reason I came before this body tonight and requested the suspension is um, one of it is, is impaired driving and we're looking to get uh, extra patrols out there as we approach the New Year's Eve time. And uh, by going this evening and coming in front of the body, it would give me the opportunity to spend those funds on New Year's Eve. And then throughout the rest of the year, um, we have 12, six other deployments where we'll be utilizing these funds on high visibility traffic enforcement. Motion to approve to Second. Second. I have a motion and second to approve 292.19. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That is unanimous. Thank, Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chief. Is there anyone else wishing to speak during public forum at this time? <coughs> Seeing none, uh, if there are no objections. We'll now hear a, a report from the Committee on Records. Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Mr. President. We have reviewed the records and they appear to be in order. Uh, seeing no objections, we'll. Uh, uh, pass that by unanimous consent. Um, communications from His Honor the Mayor. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Joseph Byrne is a member of the Fitchburg Council on Aging, term to expire December 31st, 2022. Uh, second, for Mr. Uh, Richard Houdela as a, a member of the Fitchburg Council on Aging, term to expire December 31st, 2022. Third, for Ms. Uh, Diane Olette as a member of the Fitchburg Trustees of uh, Public Burial Grounds, term to expire. January 1st, 2023, and fourth uh, of Miss Adrian uh, G. Clark is a member of the Fitchburg Trustees of Bur uh, Public Burial Grounds, term to expire February 1st, 2023. Um, we also have a, uh, an appointment letter of Miss Lynn Butland as an associate member of the Planning Board, term to expire December 31st, 2021. Those will all be sent to appointments. And uh, communications and reports from uh, heads of departments. Uh, we have one such communication uh, regarding budget and assessments uh, for the regional school district, Montachusett Regional Vocational Technical School District, which will be placed on uh, file in the city clerk's office unless there's uh, another request. Seeing none, uh, we'll now move on to the special presentation uh, scheduled for this evening for the City Hall Building Committee. I'll turn this over to A.J. Rigney and Mary Delaney. Mm -hmm. 
don't care anything. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good evening, counselors. Uh, my name is AJ Tarigny, Chief of Staff to Mayor Dinatawi. With me this evening uh, is uh, Mary Delaney, our Chief Procurement Officer, and also uh, the Chair of the City Hall Building Committee. Uh, behind me is our, our friend Ned Collier with Icon Architecture for the City Hall Building. Uh, behind him to, uh, is Tony Deluzio. Uh, he's with Collier's International. They're going to be going up and presenting. Uh, uh, Tony Deluzio with Collier's International, uh, Pam Bailey with Bond Brothers, and our, our very good friend Jerry, <laughs> Jerry Hamsley uh, with Bond Brothers as well. Uh, thank you for joining us on this fine snowy evening. Um, so the idea uh, of this evening is to go through uh, project updates. Uh, we're actually, we met a year ago from today uh, uh, on, on the City Hall project. So a lot has, has happened during that time, and, uh, and we're here to go through those things. I would also like to mention uh, that Councilor Donnelly and Council President uh, uh, Kushmerick also serve on uh, the City Hall Building Committee. And with that, Mr. Collier, all yours. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Uh, the good news is... Not a whole lot has changed architecturally, so my portion is really brief tonight. <laughs> uh, the, the Bond folks will have a, a more extensive presentation on the, on the construction process. Uh, so we're going to uh, a very brief design, design <coughs> update, uh, update on the site plan review process. <coughs> Tony will give a budget update. Uh, and then the, the, the bulk of the presentation will be a review of the uh, progress on the, on the project, ending with a, a couple of uh, pieces of business that AJ will cover, uh, having to do with uh, the placement of the time capsule and uh, some large, uh, very heavy medallions, uh, as well as uh, uh, talking about a scheduled tour of the building. The building. So as I, as I mentioned, the, the plans for the project have uh, really changed very little since we, we last saw you. That's as it should be. We shouldn't be having any major uh, changes uh, over the course of the construction uh, of the project. Um, we are uh, under Collier's uh, leadership uh, moving forward with the furniture planning uh, on the project uh, based on the, the, the plans that you see here. Uh, and just to, to remind everybody, on the, the main floor, the, the treasurer and the collector are on the right-hand side when you come in the uh, original front door. The city clerk is to the left-hand side. Um, as you move back into the building, uh, you pick up veterans, recreation, the auditor, and the assessor, and that fills out all of the first floor. We don't have the basement plan in here. Uh, that's all storage for the various departments who have very equitably helped us divvy up uh, the space down below. So then on the second floor, uh, the, uh, there is a community gallery at the, at the front of the building, uh, along with an opening to, uh, to the main lobby below. Uh, and on this level, you can find the Board of Health and the building department uh, in the front of the, of the building. And then in the, the uh, 1879 addition to the building, uh, the offices, the procurement offices, uh, uh, the staff break room, and uh, offices for the uh, facilities, the folks who will, who will run and maintain uh, the City Hall campus. And then finally, on the, uh, on the 1853 portion of the building, the new third floor uh, contains the, the large training room, uh, and you may recall that's the one that has the, the, the folding glass partition that allows it to expand and serve a, a, a larger audience uh, when needed, uh, as well as uh, human resources, the retirement office, the IT department, the solicitor, uh, the two the senator and the state representatives both have small offices up there. And then finally, in the 1853, uh, 1879 portion of the building, uh, the mayor's office, and the, the planning department, um, all very much as it was um, last last time we presented to you. Um, and then finally, the the um, no longer known as the bank building, uh, it is the it is the legislative building uh, with the council chamber, 
uh, and there's some great photos of that interior being gutted later in the in the presentation. Uh, we have a caucus room, uh, public facilities, and a public lobby um, as part of that plan, as well as facilities for FATV. Um, so what we wanted to do was just very quickly share with you the interior finishes palette and some images of that. Uh, we've now gone through that process with with the, the building committee, a lot of credit to Mary and a, a, a group of folks that she corralled into helping us with the interior finishes. It's a very, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say minimal palette. Uh, <laughs> it's a very simple palette uh, on the interior and, and um, you'll see that the the uh, main lobby floor is a uh, porcelain tile. It basically looks like granite um, when, it, when it's installed. The uh, public circulation areas are a, uh, a wood look, uh, a vinyl flooring product, very durable, easy to maintain. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually used in hospitals a lot, just to give you an idea of, of uh, the longevity of it. Uh, we've selected a couple of, of carpets um, uh, of uh, different uh, patterns for the larger spaces and the, the smaller offices. Um, there is, in, again, in the public spaces, in order to minimize uh, wear and tear on the walls, a, uh, a, a wood look wainscoting. Um, so that's really just there to, to prevent the drywall, the painted drywall, from getting banged up uh, too quickly. And then there are there is one primary paint, uh, which is the uh, kind of linen white, and two accent paints that are that are used in very discreet ways. The 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 red color is, uh, and you'll see it in the renderings, uh, on the kind of door surrounds, uh, and the the uh, blue color actually only occurs at the southernmost end of the corridor where the second stair goes up. So it's just a single accent at the at the very um, back end of the building. Uh, Ned, that that that's gray, correct? <laughs> Not blue. I cannot I cannot speak for the uh, the rendering quality of the <coughs> the projector in terms of color. It is, <laughs> it's blue. Yeah. <laughs> it's gray. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it, I say it's a very deep blue. Um, so what bordering on gray. <laughs> 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 yeah. Let's it's, get it to gray, one. Ned. <laughs> yeah. it's, no, it's like I'm misspeaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gray. You're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Sorry, that's I, right. I, I was yeah, a little yeah. slow to pick yeah, up yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, so. I, I thought yeah. you might have made it. Right in the mayor's office, right. <laughs> it's a cool gray. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to yeah. uh, And then we, we have a proposal for... Uh, uh, some murals uh, that, that would be uh, basically a, 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 a printed wallpaper custom, not unlike if you've been in the idea lab uh, of Fitchburg State, the ceiling mural uh, is a similar digital process. Um, it's not 100% certain that they'll get installed uh, at this point, uh, um, but with the design is in place and courtesy of the, the historical society, um, you all have some absolutely spectacular historical aerial drawings um, that would be scanned and reproduced um, for use in both the legislative building and in the, uh, uh, the administration building. So in looking at that, so this is the, 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 <coughs> the very schematic drawing of, the, of the, the main lobby with the porcelain tile floor and the, the wood look uh, wainscoting, treasurer's office, uh, uh, clerk's office, and, and there's the <coughs> gray wall, which we forgot to change in the <laughs> rendering at the very back. Uh, if you turn around 180 degrees, uh, you're looking back out the, the front door with the two public meeting rooms in, on either side and the, the community gallery uh, up above. Uh, and then finally, on the second floor, uh, in the hallways around the perimeter of the building, um, that's where we're proposing uh, the, the kind of large-scale map graphic uh, be applied. And then in the council chamber, it would be on the wall uh, at the back, uh, behind, I should say, behind the, uh, the, the council table 
Uh, the tilt that you're seeing at the ceiling is uh, for acoustic purposes um, to help project um, voices in, into the audience. So that was the what? lightning speed update on the <laughs> on the architecture. Uh, the site uh, plan uh, has been presented a couple of times to uh, the the planning board. We will continue to update them as the project moves along. Um, there are always adjustments that are made as a as a project uh, goes forward. Um, we the, the probably the biggest change since we last saw you is that we. After a great deal of back and forth, there was a conclusion to keep the drive-through as a, uh, uh, a yard equipment storage um, room. Um, so it's it's uh, back in the back in the project. Anything else on that? Yep. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. I, you'll have an opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Council, if you want to speak, you'll have an opportunity at the end um, to ask questions. Good evening. Thank you, Tony Deluzio, Collier's Project Leaders. And in the context of tonight's presentation, you have the architectural vision, the ideas and dreams of every architect as they're putting their plans together. You have contractors involved to make that dream a reality. And I generally find myself stuck in the middle trying to find the money to pay for said dreams to become a reality. <laughs> And uh, what you have tonight here is an example of that budget in a snapshot form. Uh, your project was originally projected at 23 or approved at $23.5 million. And we stand here today still achieving that $23.5 million project at its completion. We did have some unforeseen conditions. Everybody hates that word. Uh, but we knew the building was not perfect. We knew how old the building was and we've been working with contingencies and supplementing various budgets and changes throughout the project. Initially, uh, as of today, we have $726,000 in changes of unforeseen conditions. We also had overruns in what we knew we were going to have to replace in the building in the form of structure, masonry, and waterproofing. And collectively, when you take these numbers and you add them together, just the building envelope and shell and structure, the reinforcement and redevelopment of your primary asset is 25% of the total project budget. And historically, if you look at what a building, typical building shell and core is, uh, you're, you're within that same ballpark for a building that needed a lot of work. We couldn't have planned it, we couldn't have seen it, and you'll see some of those images uh, of the types of unforeseen conditions. Uh, I think since our last meeting with this group, uh, we've had several other meetings, but we were able to demonstrate and show people, and certainly on your tour, you'll be able to see firsthand uh, the types of modifications that were done over the years where previous contractors went in and cut beams and cut columns that they shouldn't have cut without proper reinforcing, all of which systematically led up to the structural failure that was occurring within the <coughs> and the general age and deterioration of masonry products over time. Uh, so we do in fact have today total commitments to date of $21 million. So we're 90, 92% bought out of everything that we think and plan for, other than some furniture, which as Ned said, we're embarking on now with the city's procurement office. We've started to engage the city's IT department in the procurement of all the tel data, phone systems, all of the wiring and background infrastructure is included in the bid documents and in the construction. But those primary head-end IT functions and the equipment that goes along to bring the buildings to life, interconnect the two buildings, and be able to run as a campus, uh, we'll be doing that over the next couple of weeks and then the program equipment. We're spreading City Hall out, right? So in doing that, you've got departments that spread out. You've got centralized copying and centra decentralized functions as well. So we'll be able to wrap all that up in the next 90 days and be 100% bought out and really be able to then target the $2 million that's remaining, about a million two rather, of dollars that are remaining uncommitted and start to transfer those back or 
even project as a savings variance to the project budget. So we're 90% bought out. We'll be 100% committed out in the next 90 days. We're 95% committed to all of our construction dollars, which is separate than our total project. These numbers here in the owner contracts are not part of bonds contract. Bonds contract work, the only thing we're not bought out on in construction is the exterior landscaping and some of the things that will happen in the spring that we're still developing and still refining as, as we move into the site planning aspects. Um, Construction is 38% complete. So structural steel is done, reinforcing is done, brickwork is going on behind the white tarp that everybody sees. When that drops down, you'll have a brand new shiny facade, new masonry all repointed, new windows in there. So it's kind of like the big reveal when we pull that away. Um, but right now, all that work is going on kind of behind the screen. So very exciting time for you all to visit the building is Friday. And with that, now we'll turn to reality from budget. Pam? Jerry? Are you only going to talk about budget? Yeah. You stole all of my lines. You stole all of Don't talk about budget. Yeah. <laughs> talk about making Ned's dream a reality. All right. So I'm Pam Bailey, I'm the project manager, uh, Jerry Hammersley, project superintendent. And it's not that one? No, nope, it was. It was? Oh, yes, we are. Did I go too far? No. Oh. All right, so just as a quick um, schedule highlights of what um, when we started in April to end of November, um, demolition and abatement, um, obviously big chunk and needed to, you know, it's like demo has just been <coughs> going on because as we're building things and, and doing the steel, we're continuing to demo in some areas, site work and utilities. That started in the spring, and the moratorium, we're pretty much done. But again, there's some stuff that will come back in the spring and finish, but the main utilities are done. Uh, steel erection and light gauge metal framing starts right after um, we've gotten the demo and able to start putting the steel in. Exterior masonry has been going on since um, beginning, well, beginning of the fall, and that will wrap up at the end of the year. Uh, roofing. Um, which you can still see peeking over the top of the building. And then we started the demolition in the, um, in the legislative building. So that's just sort of big, big, big uh, uh, high level. So in the um, planning of the demolition and the structural steel, so early coordination uh, in a building like this, you got to consider when you're taking out as much as we took out of it structurally, you have to shore a lot of things in, uh, in place. Um, so we met early on with uh, with Unified, who was the demolition contractor. Um, we brought Isaac Blair to the table, uh, which you'll see in the in the images to follow on this one. But uh, we were able to actually save and utilize the existing structure that was there, um, and actually build the new steel in place in between all those floors to actually act as the bracing. And we limited the amount uh, in this coordination, basically, to save uh, a lot of time and energy up front, including money. Um, we just had to basically put some struts and, uh, and braces in place, um, which you can see on the next slide coming up. Uh, so basically these struts were put in, these towers went up, and that was basically to save the, the gable and wall at the back of the building and just a small kind of piece of that roof that was there to remain. Um, so as we started into this, some of the new steel had already been going in into place. Um, this vault was actually holding up the old roof that uh, that was coming off with the uh, <coughs> with the old shed dormers that were up there that everybody saw. Um, so the in order to remove that vault, uh, we had to actually take the roof off, and then we put the new roof back on while we were actually taking and removing that vault down inside the building. So you had those vaults basically on every floor all the way down to the basement. Uh, it took us roughly 25 days to remove those vaults. They were. 20 inch thick walls, uh, all brick with concrete floors. So definitely a, uh, a big piece of the demolition, but uh, grab the next one. So as you can see, this, this steel here is, uh, is the new uh, mezzanine floor that was in up above. We're standing on this floor as we were actually doing that erection. And this is the existing attic in the back of the uh, 1853. 
These beams actually, we, we telescoped them kind of through the windows with the lull, took genie lifts and kind of slid them into place all, all around all of this existing construction that was still there. Um, and then the demolition guys actually worked behind the steel guys kind of bringing the floors as we went down through the building. So we did basically top-down construction through the 79 section. So, so but one thing, and Jerry was pointing at, I was alluding to it before, with the sequencing of how we did the demo, with putting the steel in before we moved the floors, it sort of keeps the whole diaphragm of the building together. So we were able to build off of the existing floors without having to duck through too much and then mm -hmm. save money in all the, in the um, uh, budget as well. So then to the most challenging part of uh, the steel erection was the, the 1853 section. There were uh, a lot of larger members of steel that kind of had to be put in. Um, and I added one more uh, challenging piece to this for Tim's when they started to do the erection which this we had put the, all of the, uh, the duplicate slide. Oh. Sorry, we have a duplicate slide, so uh, we'll come back. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so we had staged the entire outside of the building by the time they had started this section of the building. So now they had to actually telescope these pieces through the staging as well as the windows to get them into the floors. Um, so it made things even more challenging for these guys and they were even heavier pieces of steel that they had to kind of move into place. Uh, so basically they used these genie lifts to jack them up so they had one on either end of the beams they would jack them up into place then bolt them off um, but also like to acknowledge that this is Tim's fabrication um, local steel company absolutely fantastic partner mm -hmm. in the project did fantastic job coordinating all this stuff. absolutely um, one of the uh, unforeseen uh, things that we uh, that Tony had mentioned is this this uh, proscenium opening uh, which was uh, to an old stage that was there back in the 20s and 30s, I'm told. Um, that was we, was thought to be a, uh, a shear wall that was complete brick and masonry, so that caused, once it was opened up and realized that that was just a wood frame in between, um, we had to go back uh, to the design team and we had to uh, do some redesign with steel. These uh, CMU piers had to get added and then these posts went up to the uh, to the roof structure because that wall actually supports the roof on the back end of the building. Um, so this is what it had looked like when we opened it up, thinking that that was all going to be brick. Um, and that's what your final condition is now today. <coughs> this sorry, is back sorry, on. No, no, there we go. All right, so um, this is in the back section of the 70, 79 section uh, with all the floors now completed. Um, what these are actually showing is uh, we had known about in the front of the building the large scale of uh, interior uh, brick restoration that had to be done. When the walls on the back of the building were uncovered, we discovered a lot more of the, uh, the window jams had deteriorated from, from infiltration over the years. Um, so what this is showing is all of these basically for about a foot to 18 inches back on these windows full height for like 33 feet we had to uh, do restoration of all those jams on the nine 33 foot openings around the back of the building uh, this work is all completed today um, and we're in process all the blocking is installed uh, these windows were actually delivered to redline uh, last week so um, can you skip ahead to the other one on this one more so this is the, um, the truss repairs. Um, so the front truss in the front of the building, which way you saw the roof failure, um, all the false work was in place when we took the building over back in uh, March and April. Um, we basically went in, we surveyed this whole thing. We brought in uh, Redline with their engineer to, uh, to come up with the shoring um, that we put in place. So this is actually the false work that you see here in the front. Uh, that was the, the look that you saw. There was an 11 inch sag in the center of that truss prior to, uh, to us getting started on that. Um, it is within a 16th of an inch of being completely flat. Um, it showed uh, almost zero deflection when that false work was removed. So it was a, a, a great success uh, with all the reinforcement that got added to it uh, once we had jacked it back into place. Um, what we did find Going back to those. Well, just, but then um, one of the things that I think is, is just so cool about this project is looking at how it, we, it, all of that wood is still there. I mean, this is all original, even though it's jacked up. It's still there. It's sound. And it, um, 
you know, jacking it up in sort of like um, historic ways of, of straightening out the ridge with bottle jacks and creating the saddle system. And at the same time, on the other end of the building, we've got all structural steel reinforcing in the new roof line. It's, it's just a great juxtaposition of, hey, it's still good, so let's, let's use it. Let's keep it there. Uh, so just to speak to a little more of the kind of unforeseen stuff is once the, once the truss was jacked in, uh, and made to be level again, uh, what we had realized was that the ridge condition didn't come back to what it should have come back to being dead straight like the rest of the truss. Um, basically where the purlins crossed over uh, the trusses, you had rafters that went up and they were, they were seamed at, at each purlin. So it kept the memory and the ridge line stayed down. So we had to come up with a, a system basically to, uh, to jack the ridge back into place. We actually replaced the ridge for the front 32 feet of the building. Um, so this, th that condition now is, is straight. So this is actually them doing the jacking process up in this photo here. Um, what we also came to find was that the, uh, the front of this had a sag in it as well. Um, out at the gutter line. So had we not come back to address this, you would have had a, a sag in the gutter. So in order to get everything back straight, we had to build a new knee wall across that 32 feet at the base, as well as jacking up the ridge line at the top. But as we stand today, the roof is completely straight. The front section of the building is completely roofed and we're still fighting the weather on basically getting the back, say 65 feet of the roof uh, covered in. Um, it's done with temp ice and water shield at this yes. point. But, um, you want to so, talk sure. a little bit so, to the... Uh, so then um, with the exterior restoration, with the primary things are the masonry, the wood um, tablature, um, and the their metal column capitals and, um, and brackets. So the masonry at the, be at the front part of the building just and wrapping around the returns of um, the first uh, kind of pilaster length, it's... The um, joints were so tight, and all of that is done very carefully, you know, with, with a hand um, to rake out the joints with small hand tools, a lot bigger in the back. What I like about this picture is this has been washed, and that hasn't, and they're slightly different colors anyway. It's a little deceiving, but just it looks so good, all clean and, um, and repointed. Um, the woodwork at the top, um, a lot of it, that some of it, and this is actually the uh, north, the west corner, which gets a lot of abuse from the direction of the wind. Um, so as we're, what we're doing now is we're stripping the paint off to really assess the, qual the, how the wood underneath it. We know some areas that definitely need to be replaced, but a lot of it actually is a lot better than one would have thought for a building of this age as, as far as the um, amount of wood repair and restoration. Um, in situations such as this, we won't need, we, we may need to replace this particular um, piece of wood, but a lot of this can be fixed with um, an epoxy injection. Um, it's like a west epoxy, you know, so similar to what you use on boats. Um, the brackets themselves are in really good condition. So what we were initially thought we'd be doing a lot of repairs with those, we're going to knock some of the paint off um, and then seal around the top so that there isn't water that can get into them, but that's in pretty good condition. Same with the, um, the column capitals. There is, <laughs> there is some rock though, so this is at the eave again, um, the break of the roof where it comes down on the north um, west side, and I mean it must have been rotted for quite some time. There's got a copper um, covering over copper flashing, which is I mean, the other side doesn't have. I think someone just said, okay, we'll hide it. Don't look at it anymore. Um, another one of the, the major restoration things, uh, um, and I don't have a side of it, but we'll definitely see this on, on Friday, is the stone restoration. The um, uh, brownstone sills in the front of the building, those have all been replaced, um, again, making it look super sharp. Um, and the... Um, Terracotta. My, thank you. I was like, what's that word? <laughs> uh, the terracotta arches around the, the, um, all of the win windows in the front, they have rebuilt those with a product uh, It's called Cathedral Stone. It's been used in, in Europe forever to rebuild the stone. You sort of cast it in place and then carve it away. So that's all coming out and looking super crisp. And Tony took my whole uh, 
or in the parade on the big reveal thing. <laughs> but it, it really, the windows get replaced um, starting um, you know, in the next week or so. So at the end of January, when the state, when we take all of the, the wrapping and the staging down, I mean, it's going to be, she's going to look gorgeous, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and then the legislative building. So we started demolition of this in uh, in October, uh, probably second week of October. That's the uh, the old vault on the uh, left hand side there. Uh, again, two foot thick walls. There was like six layers of rebar through all all that stuff. I think we took two dumpsters of rebar away from that. Um, this is uh, in process now of getting all the overhead uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing done. We've gone through and done all the under slab. Uh, plumbing we've replaced the concrete put that back in place so uh, we're actually doing layout we're going to be starting to frame walls in there this week so uh, making some good headway <coughs> over there as well um, we did put the roof on this building on uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving so that roof is all uh, weather tight now as well so this is just a quick okay that's where we were and then what happens over the course of the next year um, so you say the windows get installed um, and then as we're weather tight and then we're able to we started doing the rough mechanicals and overhead work and then that'll move into the finished me mechanical work as the wind and once we're weather tight partition framing can um, has started um, so we're moving through in the second and third floor with framing for the partitions um, interior finishes follow along and then lastly in the early spring we'll start with the site improvement or finish up the rest of the some of the utility tie-ins and landscaping in terms of site utilities though we're aside from two sewer manholes and just tying in the two sewer connections to the city yes once the sewer separation project is done all of the utilities have since been replaced um, the power is run the transformer is set uh, we just have to pull secondaries into the building once we have switch gear. So, uh, gas services gas. are all installed. Yep. New domestic water, new fire service. It's all that's all complete. All right. All right. So uh, quickly, um, two medallions, as you can see up here. Um, uh, this is part of the. Uh, Longsdale roof project almost. The mayor was made aware of these two medallions. You actually can see them on either end of the building. Um, and the mayor wanted them to be refurbished, taken down. So uh, with the help of our awesome fire department, we were able to remove the, the two medallions, as you can see. They're five foot in uh, diameter, approximately 200 pounds apiece. Um, uh, Dennis <coughs> Maxfield of uh, Pride Auto Body uh, was able to take uh, uh, control of them and he worked with a gentleman named John O'Connell from Ziki Design uh, who is the gentleman that you see in the picture uh, refurbishing them. So the, the idea is to uh, take one of the two medallions and, uh, and put it in part of the City Hall campus project. And um, don't look at that one yet. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, th as you can see on the, the, the right picture is uh, the interior of the uh, legislative building. Uh, and, uh, so, the, the City Hall Building Committee and the mayor uh, uh, really thought it deserved to be in a public meeting gathering space for everyone to see. So, this is one of the suggestions that uh, ICON put together. Uh, more importantly, the, the, the people that uh, helped um, uh, restore uh, the medallion um, I, I think also deserve uh, a mention is uh, Bill McShee did an excellent job uh, gathering some uh, community support from Rick Bosgard in the class of uh, 1970 from Longs Joe, uh, then Fitchburg High School, I should say. Um, uh, Linda Lottie Byrne, class of 1960. Uh, David Saluza, class of 1966. Uh, our friend Michael Montori, uh, class of 1966. And our very own Beth Romberg Walsh. Class of 1972, correct? Exactly. Yes. Yep. Um, and so, thank you to those those people uh, donating the funds to make this possible. Uh, so, we're that's a that's a work in progress as uh, it, it requires some blocking, if you will. Uh, so, uh, our uh, icon and bond are are coming up with solutions as to where we can properly place that. Uh, the, the second thing to just make you all aware of is a, a placement of a, a time capsule, if you will, uh, to be part of the overall project. This isn't anything in significant size. Uh, it would be a, a smaller uh, 
safe-like item that would go in the uh, placement <coughs> of the wall behind the, the building plaque, if you will, in the front lobby. So uh, items that we would, uh, that we're looking to include in those are <coughs> articles from, from the project, pictures from the construction, money orders from council, um, and then of course, you know, the book from, the, the signature book or sign-in book from the groundbreaking ceremony, and this is a developing thing. Uh, so this, uh, we're looking at that uh, placement again in the interior front lobby of the administrative building. The last thing to, to review with you all is uh, we have been working on interim parking needs. I'll kindly remind you, uh, we signed an MOU, if you will, with Fitchburg State uh, for a, a parking structure uh, to be built across the street from City Hall um, uh, in between uh, Allen Rome's building, if you will, and the theater block. And, but during that uh, interim period of um, design and engineering plans of the structure being built, City Hall being occupied, there's an approximate two-year time difference. So during that time, we need to uh, itemize areas for constituents, employees, and visitors to park. Um, so essentially, the parking needs that we have identified about, there's 62 parking spaces that we'll have to utilize for uh, employees, and 30 parking spaces uh, for visitors and the general par public. Uh, Lenny Laxo, our previous bill, um, not building commissioner, uh, DPW Commissioner is a member of the City Hall Building Committee. Uh, he kindly provided me a memo to help um, understand the larger picture of what it takes to, to do interim parking. Uh, those things would up, uh, include daytime City Hall for daytime City Hall employees, uh, daytime City Hall short-term parking for businesses, daytime uh, handicap parking, nighttime parking for council and other board and commission meetings, and then of course nighttime handicap parking as well. We have identified so far 77 on-street uh, parking spaces uh, within a three to five minute walk. There will be uh, three handicap uh, parking spaces dedicated in front of Rollstone Park for the City Hall project that's part of uh, the site plan review with the planning board. Uh, there will be 17 spaces behind the legislative building, including one handicap uh, <coughs> parking space. These spaces will be reserved uh, for visitors and the general public. Uh, and then there's approximately 20 spaces uh, in the concrete lot behind the administrative building that's currently being used as a, a, a yard site. Um, this will be utilized for inspectional vehicles, uh, building and board of health, as well as city hall employees. And uh, we're in conversations with uh, uh, other area stakeholders, uh, including Fitchburg State University, uh, who, who <coughs> all already owns the lot in between Allen Rome in the theater block building. Uh, and that already has 50 spaces uh, that we can utilize as well. Uh, so that's a developing story that's, it's um, many conversations with many stakeholders <coughs> we're gonna have on that. What we do need to consider uh, moving forward is, uh, might I also add that we've had conversations with Chief Martineau to make sure his input is provided during this process. Um, any, defi any definitive uh, final solution that we make we want to make sure we present those uh, solutions to the planning board for them to review. Uh, we also have a recent Mass Works grant um, that that we need to take in <coughs> consideration. That uh, with traffic changes and uh, on on street parking changes, bike lane, and we also need to consider uh, minor but very important snow and ice as well. So during the winter time, <coughs> snow storage, uh, shoveling sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, and those things. And with that. I believe uh, you guys are all aware that we'll have a uh, site tour uh, of both buildings uh, this Friday at 2 o'clock uh, with Bond, uh, Icon, and Collier's. Uh, just remind you, closed toe shoes, um, and uh, you might want to not wear your, your fancy suit or dress that day. And with that, I leave it to you, Mr. President, for questions. And I'll just clarify that tour is for, uh, for members of this, uh, this body. Uh, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> yes, very important. Yes, for the members of the body only. Thank you. Uh, that's it. I have Councillor Zarella. I, I just had a quick question on the uh, architecture. When we saw it last, if I'm recalling correctly, mm -hmm. I seem to remember there was some discussion about not having a central entrance from the lobby to the legislative chamber just having the two side entrances to kind of channel traffic away from line of sight while meetings are going on. Um, it looked like that had changed on the plan. Yeah, it's still it's still the two side entrances, the, the, the center arch. 
Oh, okay. There's currently a door that's going to be made a window. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just there was a door icon on the. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I like that. Good. Councilor Boschman. I just want to say something. <clears throat> I noticed when I came in tonight, the mayor was very, very jolly today, and he said it's going to be a special Christmas, and I'm very hard of hearing. Did I hear you correctly saying that you're coming in $6 million under budget? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put Councillor Boschman's hearing aid in the time capsule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my question to you all is just seriously, I'm no joke on the side, if you hear over here, I talk very loud so people over there can hear me. In the council chambers, will you be able to sit anywhere and hear the people talk? Even if you're whispering like this, will you be able to hear them? There, there will be, just as you have here, a uh, sound reinforcement uh, system. Uh, so, yes, that's the goal. That is the goal? Yes. Because, so, so to, cl uh, to clarify, guys, yeah, I know that uh, Trevor from, from IT is also working on technology solutions, but we're in a library. Everything about this room is meant to dampen the sound. <laughs> Everything about this room will be meant to amplify sound for an audience and for the acoustics of a meeting. Um, so I, I know that from the design point, from the technology point, uh, I, I know early on when I first met with the team, that was, uh, you, you were actually my, you were my first consideration, Councillor Boschman. Um, you should be honored by that. Uh, but in all seriousness, we, we looked at accessibility um, uh, and disability accessibility from, from every um, standpoint to really anticipate the needs, not just uh, not just from an acoustic standpoint, but but a physical accessibility hands, uh, standpoint as well. Yeah, but, but see, I don't want to drag on the meeting here, but the only reason why I say that, if we go to a planning board meeting or a zoning board meeting, I believe that we're, we're stifling democracy because if I go in to hear what's going on and I can't hear, I can't participate. And it's only the party there can hear what's going on. It isn't right. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I've been to council meetings at the old, old at the old chambers, and I sat right behind, and I couldn't be heard the, that person talk. I couldn't hear him. Yeah, so that's the only reason why I keep on saying, make sure everybody can hear, so we won't stifle democracy, and people will actually hear what's going on if they elect to go to the meetings. That's why. Okay, thank you, and Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Squalia. Thank you. So from the year ago plans to today, the large change seems to be the floor structures. Um, when it was presented to us before, we had uh, the old section, uh, the second and third floor were at different heights than the, um, than the newer section of city, old City Hall. Um, but now uh, they, they appear to be at the same height because we we built the new floor structure on top of the existing or underneath the existing. Um, and so before there was a series of ramps and stairs, but we've eliminated those. Can you talk about uh, why that decision was made and, and what it will look like now? So now it is in fact continuous floors. There was a lot of uh, you know, number crunching as well as engineering, dealing with ramps and codes that surround those types of ramps within a building the accessibility issues. By the time we got through looking at what was actually holding the floors together, was it more economical to take the structure out to build new level structure? Uh, that was actually one of the questions that the mayor had at his recent walkthrough. Because you have those long hallways uh, on the sides of the second floor, and we had at one point a main corridor down the middle of the building that had a pitch to it as well, those have all gone away now in place of the new structure which allowed us to put in single level floors through both of the buildings. So now we eliminated the ramps and the stairs and they're completely accessible. The, the elevator no longer has to go to two additional stops in addition to second floor and, and third floor. No. Now it just has, do we have one elevator in the building? We have one elevator in the building. Hmm. There's no back elevator serving different half elevations or anything like that. Just one elevator Correct. for the building. Yep. What size is the electrical service? We are <coughs> 1,200 amps. Oh. And what size is the uh, fire sprinkler line? Six, six, inch six, inch main. six inch main. Yeah. Six inch. And what's the main HVAC system um, of the building? So there's 
two energy recovery units upstairs, and then the uh, rest of the building is uh, is BRF units, variable refrigeration system. So, like a chiller system. Uh, there are not chillers; they have condensing units on the outside okay. uh, that, that serve those units. Okay. It's more like what you would call a, a split system with yeah. the condensers Very outside similar. on mm -hmm. the pad in a much larger scale. Uh, on the, the rear of the building, like um, where the old parking garage was, a uh, condenser, like a, a bank of condensers? No, where the no. old hot dog stand is behind the park? Yeah. That's where your main mechanical electrical generator pad transformer. Yeah, I mean the transformers are the generators, they have no yeah. two of the condensing units from the two. Cool. Okay, thank you. Yep. Council Green. I would first like to just commend the work that's been done by all the partners, and by partners I mean like real city partners, because a project of this magnitude um, could not be accomplished without all the help and understanding of, of everybody that was involved. I do want to just point out that we have taken a building from the oldest part was what, 1853? And we have now converted that to almost a brand new building for 2020. So when we talk about a $24 million project, with that, we are receiving a brand new building in 2020 that hopefully will last 300 years as a testament to the work of the foundation that was already put in place. The fact that you didn't have to remove serious structure from that building and that it is still left kind of in its historic preservation, I commend you for being able to do that. I'm glad, sorry to interrupt you, I'm so glad you brought that up because the granite foundation is awesome and so, yeah, I mean, it, we didn't do anything to reinforce the granite, so she, she's sitting on top of the <laughs> same thing, she's been there forever. Right. A, a, thank you for taking the time, especially on the, the back of the building, to replicate all of the architectural detail. Um, <coughs> I, you know, I appreciate that kind of stuff, so I can't wait for the uh, marshmallow to come down so we can see it. Um, so I am looking forward to it. And again, I, I commend the work and the fact that we will have a building that will continue to stand hopefully for 300 years um, is a testament and commendable. So thank you for all the work. Thank you. 300 more years, no pressure. Yeah. And, uh, we'll bring you back then and we'll. we'll <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. It is Christmas. <laughs> Not everybody can be on the naughty list. <laughs> we'll take the extra half. <laughs> Councilor, that Councilor Di Natale seems like a great time to <laughs> turn this over to you. I'm particularly excited about the council chambers. Um, Councilor Boschman alluded to it earlier about the sound system here and the layout, and it's an embarrassment. Um, but what's even more embarrassing is the fact that we have public meetings outside of council that involve committees, boards and they have to meet in multiple locations you know you, you've got the you got committee meetings uh, that are held here but then you have things like the license commission meeting which I'll tell you I this can't come fast enough because I almost never want to go to a license commission meeting because it's in the basement of the fire station and every five minutes the overhead goes on I mean you, you can't pay attention during a meeting like that and then you got makeshift seating, and then you, you just, the, the struggle we have gone through for the last seven years to have public meetings, I would, all, I would argue that that is a deterrent to people participating in our public process. Because they look at where we're meeting, and it's a joke. It's an embarrassment. So to have a centralized location with adequate sound <coughs> is, 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 is a welcome change, because that is what municipal government should be providing. And to have the meeting here, there, everywhere, it, it's not conducive. And even for the school system, I feel bad for them during meetings like tonight, where there is no school, but the custodians are here late at night, keeping this place open so we can have the meeting here. You know, um, so I'm very eager to get that going, uh, because I used to be in the old facility, 
and that and that was even great because it was it was it was it was center it, it was structured where everyone could see each other but the public was facing us not having to do this or that and it just that was the biggest concern for me was when are we going to get this finished in order to get those centralized meeting spaces back because right now it's like throwing a dart at the map i mean our meetings are spread out everywhere um the other thing i wanted to uh, point out or ask is the, there was a statement made that the construction is 38 percent complete and that right now we are forecasted to be on budget uh, with 1.2 million dollars in possible underruns possible under unencumbered funds okay projected right now you don't know what you're going to do with that one too we are projecting to come in under the 1.2 for the expenditures that that money is currently allocated for but you could potentially as you progress need that money but but that's that's always a possibility so um, that's good to hear uh, follow on to that what is the confidence level in the construction team that because you've knocked you, you've taken out the wall you've opened up the walls and gone through a litany of unforeseen that have already taken place what's the level of confidence at this stage that you're gonna see some oh no moments or big surprises or is are you over that kind of hump at Pretty this point slim at this point I'd say we've eliminated most of the risk yeah. of, of having that at this point okay uh, with all of our demolition done all of the structural steel in place the roof and the building envelope as much as we've we've uncovered everything we're going to uncover and have 90% of what we've uncovered repaired complete or at least this point defined as to what we need to do and a cost associated with it defined and covered within the budget so that we can complete that work relatively soon so to me this would be a huge victory uh, for the city and, and the taxpayer because when it comes to government projects their inclination is to think that whatever we think the cost is going to be it's going to be way more than that <laughs> so <laughs> right so um, the fact that where we've eliminated most of the risks and we still have that 1.2 million in unencumbered funds uh, with confidence that we're going to meet budget at the very worst it should I want to emphasize that to the viewing public that this project has been managed exceptionally well I, I, I had I headed capital expenditures for a defense company for three years ten years ago and there wasn't a day that didn't go by where the project as soon as it started <coughs> there were all these oh no's and we didn't have enough contingencies and we had to keep doing change orders and increasing the budget so I was coming into the skeptical that you're gonna meet budget just from my experience in the private sector of how many times that's actually happened because you don't know what you don't know but to hear this status update that most of the risks risks have been retired 90 percent of which have been repaired and you still have some contingency left or unencumbered funds should give some people some confidence that this project has been managed very well um, and that while you never say never we feel as if we're all just about out of the woods here in terms of finding those big oh no moments that would that would require another change of, of, a, of a sizable magnitude so I'm very encouraged to hear this and um, I don't think it was mentioned if it was I'm sorry when when are we slated when is the facility slated to be opened when are, when are we going to be moving our personnel to this facility when is when is the project finished basically and fall, ready for occupancy right fall 2020 more we're looking at the month of November November of 2020 okay so uh, I want to thank you we all would always stress that you take your time moving in after substantial yep. completion work out the bugs of a new building yep. new mechanical heating electrical systems lighting control building management systems that m most municipalities receive new buildings and they're they're not prepared for the amount of upkeep maintenance just working out the bugs of hot cold areas you know oftentimes we turn a building over in the winter the air conditioning hasn't been run under a full load yet if we turn it over in the summer the heating system hasn't been you know fully vetted and run through its courses so take your time we'll be here throughout that process work the bugs out move I, in comfortably I'm risk averse I don't care if we don't go in <laughs> November of 2020 I only care about meeting the budget yep. and not having any problems after it's finished that could have been mitigated if we did take our time 
So I want to take our time, get this right, because that's the most important thing for me is not having to come back to the well. So if that takes another three or four months, so be it. And I'm sure the public would understand that as well, because we want to get this right the first time. We don't want to rush. So I'm glad you have that mentality, and you'll be stewarding us through that process. Better because, to be right than yep, right now. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. Mayor. <coughs> Mayor. Yeah, are, the council, are the council all set? <coughs> oh, okay. All right. So we have a couple. Uh, no, couple, go ahead. Uh, go uh, Councilor Zarell. I just yeah. have one additional question. As a member of the zoning board, which stifles democracy through horrible acoustics <laughs> and so forth, um, <laughs> though really we do have terrible acoustics where we are right now, are all of the auxiliary meeting chambers that are laid out in the plans also going to have full uh sound and whatnot uh some whether it just is uh structural acoustics or some kind of amplification systems uh the AV to facilitate part. public meetings in the auxiliary meeting rooms okay excellent okay thank you i'm good any other counselors wish to speak? I, I'll just add, um, you know, at first I, I, I want to thank uh, Ned, Tony, uh, Pam, and Jerry who are with us uh, tonight, but but your entire teams um, uh, that you're here representing, uh, you've done incredible work. And I think the fear, you know, from I think elected officials and municipalities when you when you start handing stuff over to a contractor is that, you know, it's just going to be another project to them, and that they're not going to put the same care and love uh, into the building that the host community has. But the fun part, having been a part of the, the building committee for, for a few years now and just seeing how you're interacting and making this your own project, um, I can see that you've come to, to care about this building and, and, and that you understand what this project means uh, to us as a city. I think that's crucial. I think that's amazing, and, and I'm thrilled. Um, uh, by the work and the dedication you've put in there. Um, and I'll, I'll just comment that I think there's two individuals here who have, um, you know, who haven't gotten a lot of credit around this building, who just put a ton of time and effort, and that's that's A.J. Derigny and, uh, and Mary Delaney. Um, When I when the build, building committee went on the, uh, the tour several weeks ago, uh, I thought that was... Uh, a fun part to hear from so many of the project leads on this, talking about what a pleasure it's been to work with Mary and AJ. Uh, and I think that's um, that's exciting to hear that the outside gets excited to work with a municipality. Often you hear like, oh, it's a nightmare. You know, I just can't wait for this project to be over. When you talk to contractors and instead you're hearing the exact opposite of, Wow, what a pleasure it's been to work with this city. Uh, so, so kudos to both of you and, and the other members uh, of the team that have been working. So uh, thank you uh, to everyone on this project. Mayor Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. I just also want to say thank you to uh, Tony, Tony Deluzio. He's our OPM. You saw that demonstrated tonight, his knowledge of this project and the fact that I bugged the heck out of him with making sure the numbers work. And, and what the hell do I know? Right, but all of these people that have spoken tonight, Jerry, Pam, and Ned, no, the, these these people are pros. They're the smartest group I've ever seen, and and I'll tell you, I've I've been involved in some projects similar to this in my lifetime, but it's really a pleasure to see, uh, uh, you know, such expertise brought for the people of the city of Fitchburg. This building is going to be magnificent. You might say it's a Taj Mahal. <laughs> Even if he did call that. <laughs> but seriously, and, and again, as the council president mentioned, AJ and, and Mary are involved with it every day. Tony, I bug him because I've got him on the speed dial. But, uh, you know, we're really. Uh, and, and let's not forget Peter Matson. Peter took us around again today. And he's the, uh, he's that rooster on the job that, uh, He's quiet, but he's, he just he knows everything about that building. And he mentioned something today that you might find interesting. I guess when you do projects like this, there are a lot of competing groups that come in, subcontractors. And he said he's never seen a project where they all seem to get along. And I never thought about that one way or the other, but he said none. 
some projects, they're at each other's throats. This one, he said, I've never seen anything like it. So maybe it's just that karma that we're, exp that we're putting out there in the city of Fitchburg. And Pam, that basement granite, that's Fitchburg granite. Yeah. <laughs> Came right from here. That's right. And Mayor, yeah. Pete Madsen's also from Fitchburg. He grew up in Fitchburg as well. Right. right. Yeah. He used to be a member of the class Lemons. 65? The great class. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and he was a member of the Lemons, the planning board. He told me that today. Oh. Yeah, zoning or planning, something like that. Yeah. 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 Thank okay. you. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We won't hold that against them. He <laughs> really is excited to be. That's great. And thank you all for uh, for what you do for us. And uh, Merry Christmas. Thank you. I forgot to mention, um, on, on Friday we'll be meeting at uh, One Wood Place. Uh, that is the uh, the central building that's the, uh, the yard office space uh, for the construction team. Behind the bank. Behind the bank. The, oh, legislative, the legislative building. building. Legislative yes, building, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank yeah. you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Council building. Great. <laughs> Finance Committee uh, meeting of December 10th, uh, Councilor Gina Talley. Thank you, Mr. Okay. President. Finance met on December 10th and took up uh, motion to approve several orders. orders that we all adopted. I have a motion and second to approve the Finance Committee report. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Motion carries. Councilor Walsh, Legislative Affairs. So. Uh, we met this evening at 6 o'clock. Oh, motion to accept the. <laughs> <laughs> the orders. Second. I have a motion and second to accept the Legislative Affairs uh, Committee oral report speaking on the motion. Uh, one speaking on the motion, Councilor Squalia. Yes. Um, regarding 272.19, the, the fingerprints, um, I have concerns about this ordinance in that we don't specify a lot of details as to when, what permits uh, that we, that people will have to apply for to the city and what permits will be required to get fingerprinted by the police department and then from there what the cost fee will be for people that apply for permits um, that have to get fingerprinted by the police department so uh, I'm going to uh, vote in favor of this to allow the police department to uh, do these fingerprints and send them to the FBI as needed but I would like to see additional uh, ordinance or clarification on this ordinance to determine what the fee schedule will be and exactly what permits in the city um, that we will be requiring uh, fingerprinting from the police department. For example, um, this town of Littleton, I believe, is like a hundred dollar fee for fingerprints. Um, Boston is fifty dollars. There are different, you know, towns and cities that have different fee schedules, and I would like to see our fee not be onerous uh, and unbearing to people that try to apply for any permit in the city of Fitchburg. Um, and I would also like to see the requirement for fingerprints uh, for applying for a permit in the city to be uh, only as required um, in line with Massachusetts law, for example, for uh, those kinds of businesses or applications where adults are having interactions with youth that are unmonitored those uh, would you know require those are require fingerprints uh, right now in Massachusetts state and I'd like to see those kinds of permits uh, have those requirements in the city of Fitchburg but not necessarily all permits to do any business in the city of Fitchburg thank you uh, just speaking to that concern, I, I know there was talk about a cost or a fee structure. To, to my knowledge, there was no fee structure including this. So there was no fee uh, uh, associated with this uh, ordinance. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Uh, there's a couple of other points regarding clarifications uh, and specificity uh, that I'll ask the city solicitor to address. Uh, I'm glad the chief is here, so he's more than welcome to correct me. But these, um, uh, there's no permit um, that is going to implicate somebody being fingerprinted. This would be uh, specifically for licenses. Right. So liquor license applicants uh, or a manager for a liquor license uh, would have their background checked on. Ordinarily, we would do a quarry, but we live in such a transient society to get someone's Massachusetts criminal record may not be um, um, revealing what we're really most concerned about. So right. license, not permit. Thank you. Right. Okay, and so. Um, 
I tried to identify the specific ones that come in front of the license commission, and I did speak with um, our former clerk, Anna Farrell, uh, who helped me uh, create the list, and it's in the second paragraph. It would be liquor, car dealership, hawkers and peddlers, um, ice cream vendors, license to pedal, which would be also issued by the Commonwealth, taxi drivers, <coughs> Uh, taxi or livery services, pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers, lodging houses and solicitors, not myself, but people going door to door in resident in your uh, in your constituents um, neighborhoods. Those are the people that when they come in, uh, traditionally they are executing a Cory release form and we're doing a Cory background on them uh, and as a prerequisite for them getting a license. They will now have uh, the police department will now have a better opportunity to bet them with this ordinance. It's nothing changing in our process. It's just a better betting process. I don't know if I'm incorrect on that, Chief. No, you, you, was, uh, you was spot on. But the one thing that I like to reiterate that I cannot, I don't have the authority to do this with the FBI unless this body passes an ordinance allowing um, some type of fingerprinting uh, within the city because these are non-criminal fingerprinting opportunities, uh, an ordinance has to be in place. For instance, uh, with our ice cream vendors, right now I can't even submit fingerprint applications or submissions to the FBI because I don't have this ordinance in place. Okay. So this is the very first step in the process, um, something that's long overdue that we've never had the opportunity to do full backgrounds. Our backgrounds have been very limited to just state checks through the uh, CJA system. So. This is going to expand our ability to do uh, background checks on people that are doing business in the city of Fitchburg. Councillor Zarella. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, emphasize, just as a general matter of when we're looking at an ordinance that comes in front of us, if the ordinance doesn't say that it's changing anything that's currently in place, then that then whatever is currently in place remains in place. So. I don't have the ordinance in front of me. My computer died, uh, so I can't quote from it. But if I'm not mistaken, this doesn't actually create any new instances of background checks or anything of that nature. It simply expands our ability to conduct existing requirements. Exactly. Councilor Bosch. So I want to understand this. I'm in the state. I go to the state to get a pet of hawker's license. And then I want to sell in Fitchburg. I have to pay money to Fitchburg to sell. I pay 100 bucks to the state and 50 bucks to the city to sell my ice cream. Mm -hmm. Now, I can understand that getting a peddler's or a hawker's license because you're getting them from everywhere and they're coming from different towns. But what I don't understand is why are we going after business, established businesses that are doing it? I mean, a liquor license, the guy's going to open a store. You know? He's going to be right there. Why are we? Why are we? Aren't we infringing on people's rights now? Uh, so, you, solicitor Pusateri. Uh As long as I've known any application that I have uh, made as a private attorney for a person looking for a liquor license, or sitting on the license commission, uh, the background check uh, is an important or key aspect of that application process. And uh, this liquor license, this. Uh, as opposed to just having our Fitchburg Police Department do a quarry or not even the police department or just through the clerk's office, do a quarry system, which is just a criminal organization uh, index records review for convictions of crimes in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we're going to be able to have the Federal Bureau of Investigation run a full background check based upon not what somebody says their name is, but based on their fingerprints. So whether it's for a liquor license, which we have always done background checks for, or whether it's uh, for a solicitor that's going to be going through the neighborhoods of your constituents, knocking on doors, uh, we want to know who the people are that we're authorizing to do business in the city. Of now, Pittsburgh. my question to you, so, so I don't want to take offense here, but we're going to have a religious group knocking on the doors. You're going to have them get fingerprinted? Yes. You are? Yes. Isn't that against... I thought they were against the Constitution here. You know, for, you know. They're going to be solicitors, and they're going to be selling things door to door. They're going to, they're going to get. No, they're trying to win you over. Selling you. I mean, I'm not sticking up for it. I get annoyed sometimes when they come to my I'm door. I'm not going to tell you. I know the definition of whether whether or not a 
a religious group group would fall within the definition of a solicitor or a canvasser. Uh, suffice it to say that if they do qualify for a license, we are going to have a background check. We, this ordinance, I, let me, not what I, we're going to do, this ordinance would permit your um, license commission and your police department to fully vet those applicants. All right. And I think with the fee, there is, so I think to your point, there are fees already established for the different licenses, and this doesn't change those fees at all. So there will be some fee that gets paid, but they're paying a fee to us for a liquor license. They're paying a fee to us for a solicitor's license. They're already paying those okay. fees. Yeah. Councilor Zarella. Uh, just to address my colleague's concern, uh, with respect to any any sort of religious liberty concerns or anything of that nature, as long as we don't impose any greater burdens on religious solicitors than we would impose on secular solicitors, we're in the clear. Councillor Squalia. Um, so, the there is no fee additional for the fingerprinting process written in the ordinance, which means that we will be imposing no additional fee for fingerprinting, for applying for any license? I, that's correct, and if there's gonna be a new fee, I think it's, I think it's this body that adopts fees, right? Yes, that's so correct. it yes, would have to come back through here. And so the way that the ordinance is written, are we requiring every license to submit two fingerprints for FBI? Um, review or is it at the discretion of the licensing board per applicant or per the ordinance? So paragraph two does re use the words shall submit. So it, it's a requirement days. for the licenses. Yes. Are there any licenses in the city that are not required um, to um, apply for fingerprints? Not that I'm aware of. The list of license in this ordinance um, comes from a review by um, former Clerk Farrell and I going through the types of licenses issued by the License Commission and those that historically have background checks. So we're not expanding a, the requirement for a background check. We're expanding the background check. That's so, what we're doing. Right. So so we're requiring any any of these licenses in Fitchburg to now supply up uh, um, have fingerprints. Fingerprints, as opposed to just telling us what their name is. Correct. And is this a yearly? Um, uh, what, what is the existing um, requirement for these um, licenses, like for all the bar restaurant owners? These, the, I don't these think that there is an ongoing yearly background check. I'm not sure that their quarry is run every year when the renewal happens. I don't know. If, I don't think it is. And I think the solicitor's licenses. Um, uh, you just do a background check when you issue the license. There's a time frame on that license, and I just don't know it off the top of my head. But if they wanted to re get a new one, they would have to do that. I do know the taxi licenses, we do that uh, background check at least on the initial. That could be reviewed uh, every three years, if I was to guess. I think there's a, it's either three or five years to get a new, to get a new taxi license. And for all these licensees that need to now go to the police department to um, submit to fingerprints, are we anticipating that this will be quick and, and smooth, or are we anticipating maybe backlogs and lengths of time delays? This, is, this ordinance is intended to streamline this. As I think the chief had indicated, uh, having this ordinance uh, will allow them to work more efficiently with the FBI to run these records. They actually will have the authority, and they'll be able to point to it, and I think that would clear up a big, I don't know about the efficiency. The efficiency uh, uh, much more efficient. I mean, the, the the fingerprints are almost instantaneous when we run it. When we do a fingerprint scan on our live scan machines, it's almost instantaneous. Well, we're getting information back from the FBI regarding God bless. The, regarding the actual mm -hmm. submission of those fingerprints. Um, I can't sit here and say there's going to be not going to be a backlog. I, I have a backlog on my license to carry applications. Um, you know, this is, and what was said tonight, this is just one further step of what we're already doing. Um, it's bringing us to the next level of how we're looking at people that are coming into the city of Fitchburg to do one form of solicitation or another. Okay. Uh, Chief, uh, am I correct in understanding <coughs> this is uh, the, the 
uh, a practice throughout a, a wide majority of uh, cities uh, across the Commonwealth? Most, uh, I would say the majority of them have a ordinance in place because without the ordinance, the FBI will not even accept my submission. They accept my submissions on criminal applications, but they will not accept my submissions on civil applications without an ordinance in place. And so if you're an operator in another city or town, you're, you're used to this. This is just part of operating for you uh, most we, of the time. Uh, in conjunction with the solicitor's office, we pulled up similar ordinances across the state. We looked at what the verbiage was, um, and we pretty much brought it all together that what we thought would fit the city of Fitchburg. Thank you, Chief. Councilor Walsh. That was actually my comment that, that this is not uncommon. Um, this is common throughout the Commonwealth and throughout other states as well. So I mean, we're not we're not like breaking new ground here. This we're just catching up with uh, what the rest of the the Commonwealth is doing. Council Green. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like this is just another layer of public safety in place for people who may be coming to our door soliciting a service, and I would like to make sure that anybody that comes to my door has had a background check or that anybody that I'm doing business with in the city of Fitchburg has had a background check. I mean, I almost every year I apply for a peddler's and hawker's license so that I can participate in civic days. So I'm not opposed to submitting my fingerprints to know that I'm of no threat to anybody in this community. Well, I say that now. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> right. Chief maybe has a different idea. But I mean, no I, worry, I like. It's reflected in the minutes. <laughs> right. Right. Um, right. Note that. Um, but I just think that it's another layer to keep our public and our community safe from people who may want to do us harm. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Caddy. I was just going to say the same thing. You know, s people come to you for different reasons, and they tell you who they are, but you don't know really who they are. So this is just a, a, a layer of public safety that's badly needed in all aspects of society. Councillor Ginitale. I'm getting the sense that some of the line of questioning is geared towards making it sound like we're not being friendly to business. That seems to be the hoorah mantra outside of this meeting. Um, does the utopia next door where business is growing by the leaps and thousands and bounds over there, do they do this? I can't speak to that. I'm not sure. I'd like um, to know if the surrounding communities do this. I know it was mentioned this is common, but I know where this is going because we have a reputation which is false that we're not business friendly this is just an added layer of security and quite frankly if people have nothing to hide they shouldn't be worried about it um, we have to do this if we want firearms you know I, the one of the biggest complaints I get about solicitation from residents is the energy the the third party supplier of energy they, they I get it every week almost someone came to my door with a you know an ID tag and was knocking on my door, went around the house to the back way to see if I was home. It's, they don't know who these people are that are showing up at the doorstep, and then Unitil puts out that scam alert, you know. So it, it, it's an added layer of security. But I, I, I hope this doesn't get construed later on that we are adding more burden on someone who wants to do business here. That is not the case. No one has said it's the case. And I'm just curious to know what the gold standard of the United States next door does since, you know, that that's what we're always compared to you know so I just I'm just curious you know I mean I consider us the gold standard so so do I <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I would argue these places don't follow the rules but that's a whole nother story this came to my attention from my counterparts in Pittsfield and Holyoke okay um, I discovered it at a chief's meeting that this is something we were missing here in the city and that's when I first had discussion with the solicitor saying we need to move in this direction um, and I'll give a very quick, brief uh, analysis of why it's important. Someone comes to the clerk's office, they want to apply for hawkers and peddlers. They give Madam Clerk a picture ID. Madam Clerk can run a quarry check on that person on whatever they gave them. You can buy an ID anywhere. You can have one made at any university across the state. And you don't know who that person is. And the clerk will do a background on the picture ID that was given to them. You put in that name, that date of birth, and miraculously nothing comes up. 
Well, they may have bought that ID. Now you go one extra level and you have to run their fingerprints. We will know if that person did anything in the country or the world because we're going to do that type of extensive search through the FBI. It's one more level of security that I think is important for the for our people in the city. So right now, Chief, if I lived in, let's say, Ringe, New Hampshire, and I just go right over the border, um, you said that the, the, the background check is only confined right now to the state criminal records. We do a, we do a Corey check. We do a state and, and a federal background okay. check. Yep. And the background check that the clerk does is a little bit different than my background check, where she's only receiving convictions. convictions. I receive everything. I receive all arraignments. My, my background is much more extensive, but I'm very limited what I can do background checks on. It can only be for criminal nature. So the clerk does hers based on that ID, and it's, you're getting such limited information, you're not getting the true picture of who is wanting to do business in our city. This one extra layer of a fingerprint analysis will provide a much greater security for, for anybody coming into the city. And you mentioned the, the solar people. We were inundated with, with solar applications that, you know, it was almost weekly they were coming in. And uh, I just think this is going to be bring us to another level of making sure we know who is in our city working. Sounds reasonable to me. Right. And Thank keep you. in mind, this is this is voluntarily. If they if they have something to hide, they're not going to come to us. So Where are we at? it's not we're not mandating it. You don't have to have hawkers and peddlers here in the city. Yeah. So if I want to open up a restaurant, if I want to open up a restaurant, do I do fingerprinting? Do I have to have my fingerprints done? Are you making an application for a liquor license? Liquor license? Liquor license. Yeah. yeah. If yes. You license, yes, yeah. you would. But if you yeah. don't have a liquor license, you don't need one. That's correct. Correct. Okay. And the ABCC is also going to do a background check. Right. On but you, as well. I, you know, I like in the private sector, we, I, I just started a new job in the private sector. I was subjected to a drug test, background check, the whole nine yards. I mean, you know, going in what you're expecting, and obviously, if you got nothing to hide. What do, you, what do you care? I mean, I, that's just my opinion on it. So, I mean, if, if, if there is a need and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's prevalent throughout the state, especially in this state, you know, you would think that this would be the first state that would have problems with civil liberties. But, you know, so I, I, just, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure it's understood that this is not going to add burden to business growth in the city of Fitchburg. You know, I, I just don't want that conversation to steer in that direction. If it wasn't going to, fine, but that was my interpretation of where this was going because we're adding another burden on the people who want to come do business here. No, we're not. So, thank you. Councilor Donnelly. Uh, since the council brought it up, I just said uh, I think I'm one of the critics to the highest degree of an anyone that's anti-business, <coughs> but I think this is safety first. And during the, during the uh, legislative affairs meeting, I brought up the fact I showed an apartment last night at 5.30, and it was a man, you know, talking to one of the tenants, uh, questioning they had a tag on. They were trying to do what he talked about, selling power. You know, I mean, I just told the woman, you're going to save 0. .000 something percent for a little while, and then the rates will go up and you'll never know it. It's, it's not like it's, um, you know, the Redevelopment Authority. We've had someone, unitil rates, I mean, I don't want to get into a lecture, but unitil the gas, we stopped buying gas from some other company because unitil's rates are so low. How often do you hear that? Um, it's the first election year, I think, in the last number of years that people didn't talk about unitil's rates. People, they, when the rates are low, they never talk about them, and the gas rates have been substantially low. And it's not the electric, electricity cost, which is these vendors are selling, it's the distribution charge. So uh, I just, he said, can I talk? I said, go ahead, you, you're licensed. If, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it. But um, I can understand why Unitel, when the rates are low, we don't talk about it. And the rest of the time, we do, and I, I just think it's the wrong thing for, especially for politicians to be talking about it. So, thank you. I have a motion and second to approve the legislative affairs. It's speaking on the motion, Council. Motion. The motion. I just want to talk about 291-19 for a minute, oh, no. 30 seconds, because I'm in favor of it. 
On, on the 291-19, I talked to the city tre treasurer and the planning board, and they said that we should be very careful when we come to the, our, on the restrictions and not take them away. We should follow what they recommend unless they have a really good excuse and they don't mind working with them because they put the restrictions on for, for a reason, and they told me that a couple of times when they sold property and they, they didn't have a restriction, they got burnt. And that's why they, the restrictions are on this. I'm going to vote for it. I'm just letting you know why, what they told me on the restrictions. Why they put the restrictions on it. So this matter was specific. I got an education on this one. Um, this is specific to this specific property and this specific property owner. And this is an example of the city being friendly to yes. development by giving this person an extension, you know, and not saying, nope. You lucked out. Next, you know we're 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 working with this person in this specific case. I made sure in the committee meeting that this wasn't a uniform thing we're going to do throughout. Mm -hmm. This is just for this person, so that's why I supported it. Thank okay. you. That's all. This way. case, I mean. I have a motion and second. Mr. President, I'd like to call for a separate vote for two seventy two nineteen. Uh, I uh, <coughs> we can split uh, the vote, so I have a. Um, Motion second to approve 272. Point of order. Uh, point of order uh, Council uh, this Zarela. is a motion to approve the committee report. That's right. Not a motion on each individual item. That's correct. Uh, yeah. So it Thank can you, only Councilor be Zarela. split by <coughs> motion to amend. Thank you, Councilor Zarella. I have a motion and second. Motion to amend. <coughs> Has to be the person who made the motion. Second. Does it have, have to be the person that made the motion? No. It does not. Okay. As I have a motion and second. second. Um, all those in favor. Okay, speaking on the motion. Um, I, I don't believe you can speak to this motion. We, we need to dispatch this. Um, uh, motion to amend is debatable so long as debate only extends to the merits of the amendment, not to the merits of the underlying motion. I'm sorry, for clarification, are we amending it? We, we have motion to Motion and second to amend. amend. Okay, thank you. Motion and second to amend um, uh, to approve 272.19. Uh, to split the vote, so this would be to 270. We're voting now on... Approving 272.19. Uh, we'd be voting or to split, amend the motion. Split, right, to amend the motion to focus solely on 272.19 first. So, all those in favor of amending the motion so that it reflects uh, simply 272.19 first. Aye. Aye. Those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? The matter is before. Motion to approve 272.19. Second. Motion and second to approve 272.19. Speaking on the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? One in opposition. Councilor Squalia. Motion carries. Motion to approve 278.19 and 291.19. Uh, Second. Listed that way. Can we? Okay. So, uh, so I'd ask that we send that to its first reading. Um, because it's listed as an ordinance, we can send it to the first right. reading. So I'd ask for a motion. Motion to send 272.19 to its first second. reading. I have a motion and second to send 272.19 to its first reading. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? One in opposition. Councilor Squalia, motion carries 9 to 1. Move 278.19 and 291.19 be second. adopted. I have second. a motion and second uh, to adopt 278 and 291.19. Speaking on the motion. Um, point of clarification, the 278.19 is not to so, approve. So to approve the committee's to recommendation right. yeah. okay. on 278 yeah. and 291. Thank you. Right. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Motion carries. Uh, ordinances. 28.19 be sent to its third and final reading and rolled ordained and second. advertised. Second. I have a motion and second to send 288.19 to its third and final reading and rolled ordained and advertised. <laughs> Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Carries. 289.19 be sent to its third and second. final reading and rolled ordained and advertised. Second. second. Motion second. and second to send 289.19 uh, to its third and final reading and rolled ordained and advertised. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Motion carries. Councilors, we have a uh, appointments committee. Uh, I just ask that we uh, we give uh, these two items leave to withdraw uh, while uh, some further work is done. So moved. I have a motion. Second. And second uh, to give leave to withdraw uh, to the, the two appointments. Speaking on the motion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. It's unanimous. Board of carries. Uh, lastly, I just want to uh, to wish everyone in the city a, uh, a safe and happy holidays. Uh, this will re represent the last um, meeting of uh, this city council. Uh, finance uh, will not be held next Tuesday, uh, so we will see you at the organizational meeting at 10 a.m. on 
uh, Monday, January 6th. So again, happy uh, Happy New Year to everyone and safe and happy holidays. So the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Yes, Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.